Good evening. Thank you for coming. And I want to thank the Conservative Institute and uh, especially Peter Gonda for everything that he has done to bring me here tonight and to make me feel welcome and give me a chance to see uh, Bratislava for the first time. I want to thank my translators uh, because I know from experience that if I make mistakes, a, a good translator will make those mistakes go away. <laughs> and uh, this, this is uh, what I once wanted to be a uh, cover of uh, A Brief History of Liberty. I will tell you a bit more about this uh, photograph in a moment. But uh, first I will explain the tragedy of the commons. The basic concept can be explained in many different ways, but I like to try to turn the concept, the problem, into one that is really fairly simple arithmetic. I think it is, uh, it helps make it clear how dramatic and paradoxical uh, this problem is. So suppose that there is a parcel of land uh, any natural resource and any parcel of land will have what ecologists call a carrying capacity. It's probably the most basic concept in the field of ecology. The carrying capacity is the level of traffic that a resource can sustain indefinitely. So in the case of a pasture with animals grazing on it, it would be the number of animals that the land can sustain, can feed, more or less indefinitely. So just suppose, it's a, it's a toy example, just to keep the numbers as simple as possible. Let the parcels carry in capacity equal 100 animals. That is the level of use that the resource can sustain inevitably without the pasture, without the land being degraded. Now suppose that this land is inhabited by 10 shepherds. Each shepherd has a flock of 10 sheep so that their 10 flocks together are 100 sheep, 100 animals, and that then is at the lamb's carrying capacity. Suppose also, that the, um, these flocks are privately owned. Each flock of 10 is owned by an individual shepherd, but the land is held in common. It is treated as a communal pasture. So the question is, what is going to happen? Well, at the carrying capacity, then each animal, each sheep, again, just suppose to keep the uh, mathematics simple, that each animal is worth a dollar or a euro. I should probably say a dollar. If I say the euro, that will make it sound like I understand something about Europe. Uh, but uh, so suppose it's a dollar. The individual flock of each shepherd is ten animals times one dollar. It's ten dollars. That's what. That's the value of what each shepherd owns. And then the total grazing on this land, all ten flocks of ten sheep, a hundred sheep, times one dollar equals a hundred dollars. Now we have a shepherd who is deciding to experiment by adding an extra sheep. Now what happens? Well, again, just suppose that since we're exceeding the carrying capacity now, we are now imposing a bit more traffic, a bit more grazing, a bit more feeding on the land than the land can really sustain, and so it's subject to being degraded and so at this margin, instead of each sheep being worth a dollar, they, are, they have a little less access to food, and they, they don't fatten up quite as much, and then they're worth, instead of being worth a dollar, they're worth 95 cents. And so then the total flock is now 101 sheep rather than 100, but the total flock multiplied by 95 cents is $95 and 95 cents. Here's the problem. The individual flock's value 
is now 11 sheep. Of the, the shepherd who added the extra sheep, it's 11 sheep times 95 cents, which is $10.45. So notice this is what I find interesting about the simple arithmetic. This very same decision, there, there's only one thing that happened here, not two things, there's one thing that happened. This one thing that happened is both a net loss of $4.05, and it's also the very same thing is a net gain of 45 cents. So how is this possible? Which one of our calculations was fallacious here? Well. Here's what actually happened. There isn't a fallacy. Although the total cost to the group of adding the extra animal exceeded the, the total benefit, the individual shepherd gets 100% of the benefit but only pays 10% of the cost. The remaining 90% of the cost is what economists call an externality or an external cost. An external cost is a cost paid by someone other than the people involved in the decision. So in this case, one person, one shepherd decided to add a sheep. The other nine shepherds weren't involved, but they end up paying 90% of the price. And therein lies the tragedy, the commons. Because the other nine shepherds own 90% of the animals, that's why they suffer 90% of the loss involved in the falling price per head of sheep. The individual shepherd who decided to add the sheep, though, only sees the individual costs and benefits and sees that there's a net gain and acts accordingly. Here is the logic of the commons that has <coughs> begun its seemingly inevitable grind towards its tragic fate. So what can the shepherds do? Well, one option would be privatization. So that means the shepherds could cut their jointly owned territory into 10 individual smaller parcels. Now each shepherd owns a small flock as before, but also owns a small parcel of land with its own individual carrying capacity. So under this new arrangement, instead of dispersing the cost, the environmental degradation over the entire commons, the damage is concentrated on the offender's land. So instead of taking damages worth $4.05, dispersing them over 10 people, 100 animals and 10 owners, the damage is concentrated within that individual shepherd's own land. So suppose that when the damage is concentrated in one tenth the area, the resulting damage is about 10 times as great per acre. So in that case, this flock of 10, which had been worth $10, is now worth $4.95 less, or whatever it is. So you've now got a starving flock of 11 worth only a little more than $5. The value of each animal has been cut roughly in half, a painfully obvious mistake. So that means that under a system of individual parcels, Everyone, all ten of the shepherds, they learn in a hurry not to add that extra animal. So in a large range of cases, this partialization, privatization, it's a viable alternative to managing land as an unregulated commons. In fact, it's a vastly superior alternative for anyone who cares about the future, who cares about preserving resources, preserving the land. It's a vastly superior alternative. But it isn't the only alternative. Another way is for shepherds to leave that land in a common pool, but instead of each tending a smaller flock of 10 sheep and ignoring the costs that they impose on each other as they add more sheep, they could pool their flock as well as their land and become joint owners of a single flock of 100 sheep. In this case, each shepherd now has an interest in all 100 sheep. Under communal management, a shepherd considers not whether to add the 11th sheep, but whether to add the 101st. Adding an extra sheep now means that for each shepherd, the result is not that the value of his flock goes from $10 to $10.45. Rather, 
the value goes from a 10% ownership of $100 to a 10% ownership of $95.95. So therefore, under this communal arrangement, ideally, no one wants to add the extra sheep. So here too, as with the case of privatization, as with switching to private parcels, an external cost has been internalized and each of the ten shepherds now has a self-interested reason to respect the land's carrying capacity. There are two ways, though, in which communal ownership won't be as good as private. First of all, communal owners uh, will have more information to process than would a private owner. And it's a more subtle kind of information. You see the entire pasture being slightly degraded. You see evidence that the value of a sheep is going from a dollar to 95 cents. Not a big change. It could be hard to, hard to detect. You could miss that change. So there's more information to process and a more subtle, difficult kind of information problem. And also, there's less incentive to process the information in a diligent way. Because each decision maker's stake in the decision is only 10% of the whole. And it's also true that a decision maker might just be one vote out of 10. So probably in this kind of arrangement, if if one of these voters, one of these decision makers, one of these shepherds can acquire some political influence, it'll likely be more profitable for them to try to use their influence to increase their share of the collective product rather than increase the total overall value of the collective product. So those are problems. But still, in principle, at least these communal owners now have a reason to care about the total value going down. At least it does affect them in some way. So it's better than that wide open access that they had before. Now, as you know overall, uh, history has not been kind to experiments in uh, communal ownership. And one of the practical issues is this, that there could be something worse in the commons than the problem of adding an 11th sheep. A much worse problem is a problem of adding an 11th shepherd. So let's talk about that. I'll tell two stories, maybe three stories. The first story comes from the coral reefs of the Philippine and Tongan Islands. It is a tropical paradise. For generations, inhabited by indigenous peoples who lived by fishing the reefs with lures and traps, primitive technology. But then they went high technology and they switched to something called bleach fishing, which means they pour bleach into the now fish are oxygen breathers. They breathe oxygen through their gills. They're not very good at breathing sodium hypochlorite, bleach. So they suffocate and they float to the surface where they become a much easier harvest. So that part is good. The problem is the coral that these fish inhabit is itself a living animal. It can't breathe bleach either and it dies along with the fish, and so it ceases to be a viable habitat. And by the way, if you like bleach fishing, well, you will love blast fishing, which involves throwing dynamite into the reefs, just blowing up the coral, and then the concussion knocks the fish out and they float to the surface and again become easy harvest. So, the bottom line then is that people have new more efficient, high technology ways of taking a renewable resource and blowing it up, blowing it away for the sake of a one-shot harvest. So, 
you want to do something about this. Everybody wants to do something about this. So the obvious thing is tell those fishermen to be nice. Tell them to be responsible. Tell them to think of their children and save the reef for generations to come. And if you say that, you miss the point. They are thinking of their children. They don't have the option of saving the coral for their children. The coral is in the commons. If they don't blow the reef up themselves, the next blast fisherman in line will. If they give up the quick kill, it won't be for the sake of their children. It will be for the sake of the next blast fisherman in line. If they want to have something to give their children, if they care about their children, they have to blow that reef up themselves. They pocket the money, put it in the bank, somehow save it. Because it's a constant. The second story is from the Cayman Islands, which is a tropical paradise. It's one of the themes tonight. The Atlantic green turtle, long prized as a source of meat and eggs. By some estimates, 30 years ago, there were only 3,000 left in the world, in the wild. Now, commerce in these Atlantic green turtles had been regulated since 1973 by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. It had been regulated also within the United States by the Fish and Wildlife Service, by the Department of Commerce, by the Department of the Interior. And that sort of protection didn't work. Turtles are a commonly held resource. So some of these departments attempted to police this commons, but it's a big ocean and they failed. So the poachers, continued to harvest that resource by dark of night. In response, a group of entrepreneurs and concerned scientists, they started a company that they called the Cayman Turtle Farm. They hired the former poachers. The former poachers knew the habits. They knew the biology of the turtles. So they hired the former poachers, put them to work, by finding the nests, which might have a hundred eggs in them, taking half the eggs from the nests and taking them back to the farm and raising those turtles themselves as farm-bred animals. That was legal because the existing regulations had contained exemptions, turned out to be somewhat ambiguous exemptions, regarding the permissibility of commerce in captive bred animals. Now in the wild, if you look at those clutches of 100 eggs that hatch on the beach under the full moon every now and then, most of those hatchlings will be seized by predators before they even get to the water for the first time. Gulls and such. Uh, will, uh, and rats will, will grab those turtles before they even get to the water. So in consequence, as few as one-tenth of one percent of the hatchlings survive to breeding age adult. One-tenth of one percent. But through trial and error, Cayman Turtle Farms boosted its survival rate to 50 percent. A massive, massive increase. So the company became profitable and developed a worldwide market. At the peak of operations, they were raising over 100,000 turtles. Nobody knew exactly how many, but it was well over 100,000 turtles. They were releasing large numbers of hatchlings and yearlings into the wild. But activists complained, concerned people, people who had their heart in the right place, they complained about profiteering on the backs of the endangered species. And so in response to public pressure, the government of the United States got rid of the exemptions for captive bred animals. Now, that meant that Cayman Turtle Farms could not sell to American markets anymore. And there was something worse than that. Because they couldn't go through the Miami International Airport, because that was on American soil, 
they had no way to get their product fresh to European markets. So they lost the European market as well. They're still in business uh, today, but they're only selling to local fish markets, local restaurants on the Cayman Islands themselves. <coughs> Okay, so finally, I will tell, tell you a third story about the, the Jamestown colony. My wife is in the audience. Uh, she grew up uh, in Virginia, only 10 or so miles away from the Jamestown colony, which was the first uh, permanent English settlement in North America. So it begins in 1607 as a commune. It's sponsored by the London-based Virginia Company. The land is held and managed collectively. There's a colony charter. It guarantees to each citizen, each settler, an equal share of the community product, regardless of the amount of work personally contributed. What happened? Well, of the original group of 104 <coughs> settlers, Two-thirds of them died of disease and starvation before they even got to their first winter. New shiploads would then replenish the population. The winter of 1609 then cut the population from 500 to 60. In 1611, visiting governor, he was a marshal at that time actually, uh, he later became governor. But visiting Marshal Thomas Dale, he writes in his journal that he found living skeletons bowling in the streets waiting for someone else to plant the crops. Actually, I said living skeletons. The word in his journal was anatomies. You know that word anatomies? You picture in your anatomy textbook like all of the flesh is gone except for the bones and a few muscles. So that was the uh, figure of speech that Marshall Dale used a striking figure of speech. And uh, with Kate's help, we visited in, in the 400th anniversary in 2007 and seven of Jamestown. We visited uh, <coughs> and we talked to, because I was doing research on it and because Kate had grew up in town, we had lots of anthropologists and so on who were happy to show us behind the scenes. We read journals and in the journals, People, people would write in their journals, we're all going to die, we're all going to burn in hell. People will say it was because of the Indians, or people will say it was because of the water, or disease, or bad weather, or bad luck, and it will all be a lie. The truth is, is too horrible even to mention, which is that we didn't care enough about living to gather food. Now, so their main source of food then consisted of things like turtles and raccoons that they, could, that they could go out and hunt in the middle of the night before their neighbors could show up, and they could eat it before the neighbors could show up to demand their equal share. So in 1614, now Thomas Dale is the governor, and he's seen enough. He, he decrees by martial law that this uh, experiment be abandoned. He assigns three acre plots to individual settlers, which reportedly increased productivity sevenfold. I think that's a casual estimate. Uh, I don't think any, any careful statistics would get that, but the casual estimate was that it increased productivity sevenfold. The colony converted the rest of its land holdings to private parcels then in 1619, and we still have a Jamestown today. What was the point of going communal in the first place? Well, in fact, if you've seen it, you know the logic, you know the logic all too well. There are reasons to go communal. This is a picture of behind the scenes of some of the excavations that they saw. And you see strange things. There were Indians who became hot. These people stole food from the Indians. Not, the Indians didn't steal from these people. These people stole from the Indians. And so after a while, the Indians became hostile. And so they would do things, they would build the fort, but right next to the cover, within easy striking distance by the Indians. There was, there was a real incompetence there. They didn't care enough to protect themselves, really. And during the winter, they would tear down their fences for firewood. Uh, so they, they didn't care. Um, and they damned themselves for not caring. They wrote in their journals, they said, 
we'd be fine if we just wanted to live, but we don't. So what was the point? Well, there are a couple of big advantages which did matter here. One was risk spreading, which is mutual insurance. So communal regimes are adopted in places where you can't go to your insurance salesman and buy insurance, where the risks are substantial and these alternative risk spreading mechanisms aren't available. So that's one way of one reason to communize. So if somebody is in London deciding whether to enlist for this trip, and the guy in London, and the guy in London says, "So if I break my ankle, I starve, and my family starves," and they would say, "No, no, no one is going to starve. You will be fed by your community, even if you never lift a finger to feed yourself." So that's part of the reason for the communists is to spread risk and to provide security. You know that. But as a historical fact. When you've got people making a free choice, as communities build up capital reserves to a point where they have uh, resources to offer through insurance companies, public or private, they tend to switch to private parcels if they're given a chance. So in the United States, you see Jamestown, the Plymouth Colony, Salt Lake uh, Colony, um, uh, Amana Colonies. Uh, they, the com they started as communes, but the communal owners switch to private ownership uh, so as to be able to induce people to want to plant vegetables and plant crops and so on. So that's one reason, just is to spread risk, to provide security. More generally, you could say it's a fear of individual responsibility that leads people to conference. Second thing is economies of scale. When you're just starting a colony, the first thing the settlers need to do is build up an overall infrastructure. You need to drain the swamps, you need to build a fort, you need to dig latrines, large projects involving large numbers of uh, workers with coordinated effort. But as the colony's economy develops, the prosperity of the community increasingly comes to depend upon individual efforts and individual creativity and productivity figuring out ways to plant crops to increase the productivity of your land or the productivity of your cows and find a way to bring that product to your customers at an inexpensive price. So more generally, the idea, one of the serious advantages of potential advantages of communal ownership is that as economists say, you can reduce transaction costs. It's always easier when you don't need to ask permission. Just go gather the crop. Now, maybe the most successful, remarkably successful, strong communes in Western civilization exists in the heartland of North America. I grew up in Saskatchewan, the, the middle of the grain growing belt in, in Canada. And near where I grew up were Hutterites. Colonies. They were chased out of you know, this uh, in Central Europe about 500 years ago, uh, and, and eventually a couple of hundred years ago, they ended up uh, in, uh, in Canada, in the United States, then they moved to Canada because of the Civil War, and they began to grow crops. Now, there are about 30,000 Hutterites living in North America today, and their communities have really some unique features that make their kind of communism work. First of all, there's a population cap. When they reach a, a population of 120, the families have to draw lots, take a chance. By, by chance, they split up and half of them stay, half of them leave to start a new community. So they have to stay small enough that everybody knows everybody. Everybody's a neighbor, nobody's anonymous, nobody gets to hide. And another thing is they have communal dining and worship. They all meet several times a day under one roof for religious services and also for their meals. So if you could imagine um, you're, you're a woman and there's you know, a large kind of communal table, 
you sit down at the communal table and you say hello to your friends and they look at you and they don't say anything, they get up and they walk away and they move to a different table. Now what do you do then? Well, you go to your husband and you say, honey, I think you've been shirking. I think you should be working harder. The word on the street is, you're not pulling, you're not doing your share. You should work hard. So the social pressure is enormous. People don't get away with being lazy. Right? There's none of this, uh, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. That's, that's not like that. Not, not in the Huffington Commons. Okay, so that helps. And then there's a, a ban on birth control. Uh, and these, I didn't mention the um, Hutterite communities, they, they uh, forsake all personal technology. They have very modern, state-of-the-art farm equipment, tractors and so on for, uh, for harvesting and planting. But in their own family homes, there's no electricity, so there's no radio, there's no television, uh, no electric toothbrush, no shaver, nothing like that. Uh, so, you know, when the sun goes down, that's it. So, because there are no alternative forms of recreation, the average woman has nine children in the Hutterite uh, colonies. And that helps, you know, keep them, you know, they're a flourishing form of life. I don't know, is it a desirable form of life? Does it seem like, you know, do you envy them? Maybe not. I don't. Would I want to be a Hutterite? No, thank you. But yet, it's clear, it's a thriving form of life. It's communism. It's serious communism. And they don't, they don't have their own private property. I think they've got toothbrushes, and, uh, and there isn't much more. It, it's very, very communal. But there's so much social pressure that no one, no one gets away. Everyone is monitored very closely. Everyone works hard. So that's a, a very successful, but also a very unique form of communal ownership, and especially that, that population cap. If you think of how important that is, once you get to a size where you've got maybe a leader, a central planner, but the central planner doesn't know what's going on up there really, doesn't know what this hand is doing, doesn't know what this hand is doing, it's going to break down. It's not going to work. Uh, another uh, alternative for the most strikingly successful form of communal uh, uh, institution in America. This is what is known as suburbia. I actually have a... These are open access roadways. So these here, if you can see it, these are open access roadways. And these little squares along the side of the open access roadways, those are family communes. Families live in those little squares. They're called houses, uh, technical term. And, uh, and within those houses are things like living rooms. And the living rooms are, are communal property. Everyone from the family comes and goes as they wish, pretty much. So it's a, it's a, little, bit of, it's a little bit of communism. Uh, in American suburbia. So the point, maybe, is that in a free country, you're definitely not going to see total communism. In a free country, the means of production will be privately owned. The responsibility to make consumption decisions will be a private decision. But transportation routes roadways and waterways, they will tend to, in most places, they will tend to remain public property or communal property uh, in some way. So in free countries, what you'll see is a mix of private and public institutions of a fairly predictable, predictable sort. You know, the kinds of decisions that uh, could lead to production decisions that could lead to underproduction, consumption deci decisions that could lead to overconsumption. Those decisions will be made within the context of private property. The point of the public roadways and so on, the public waterways, is to minimize transaction costs. And that's an important thing for a community to do. Public roadways, free access 
roadways are one way to minimize the cost of getting your product to the market. And that's what you want your neighbors to be doing, is to getting their, pro getting their product to market for the lowest possible cost. So there is a place for communal management. So there's a, a red parcel in the middle of this. If you think of being the owner of that red parcel and the market is on the outside of that big square, you might ask, where are you going to go? Are you going to wait for the invention of the helicopter so that you can get your product to market? Well, no, you will open up corridors of public property between the lines of <coughs> private property. <coughs> That's one of the ways in which you can do it anyway. So there are several features of successful communes. One is that they tend to be small scale, as in the Hutterite experiments. 30,000 people, but in groups of 120. So they tend to be small scale, face-to-face -face operations. They tend to be run by local custom, not by a distant bureaucracy. Right? So it won't be some big government in in Brussels or Washington that, that makes the important decisions. It'll be families, small communities where the important decisions get made because that's where the people are who understand the problem and they understand who's part of the problem and who's part of the solution. They understand who deserves a reward and who deserves to be shunned. It's not open access even in a commune, a successful commune, you will find people exercising the right to exclude non-members. People who don't pay their dues, they will not be allowed inside. So they internalize the rewards that go with successful management. And finally, they're modest and, and partial. People will communize what needs to be communal in order to solve the problem. Uh, judges, so on, will, and litigants, people involved in this disputes, will privatize what needs to be privatized in order to solve the problem, and the rest of it they will leave alone. So in the uh, Americas, in the 1600s, when the fur trade was beginning to explode, all of a sudden with the indigenous Indian tribes who had been pretty much, they were well below their life, they didn't live long enough, and they didn't. They had too high an infant mortality to exceed carrying capacity. So there was no problem with the uh, with the game animals being communal. There was no no problem. There was no tragedy. But as soon as the fur trade happened, all of a sudden, then the scale of hunting skyrockets because there's no end to the amount of money now that you can make by selling the furs. So the fur got privatized. The meat did not get privatized. People in Paris were not asking for beaver meat or muskrat meat, that sort of thing. They just wanted the fur. So the meat was still, there was not in short supply, and the meat remained in common. So you could trespass on somebody else's land. You could hunt down an otter, say you could kill the otter, you could eat the meat to feed yourself and your family but you did not own the fur. You had to leave the fur displayed you know, on the riverbank so that when the true owners came around next, they would see that pelt and they would know that their property had been respected. And also that they had been hospitable. They had fed the neighbors and the neighbors had respected their property. So sometimes the way the property regimes work, the way they evolve, is, uh, is a, it can be exquisitely intelligent. Not always, of course. So I want to say that there are features that uh, communes can be successful. The scale on which we've attempted them in the 20th century is, uh, has been you know, a recipe for homicidal failure, catastrophic failure. That's not the way to go. But, uh, but leaving a free people alone to decide whether they want to get together as groups and ensure themselves, provide themselves with health care as groups and so on, paying their own costs as a group, that's an experiment in socialism which has a pretty long history of, of success. That you can do. 
So privatization is a solution to this tragedy problem. It's not a panacea, meaning it is not the solution to all problems. It's just a solution to one problem or a cluster of problems. And it takes different forms. Privatization can take different forms. And not all forms of privatization are equal as forms of proper resource management and resource conservation. So if these tribes back then, suppose that they had privatized the meat, but not the fur, it wouldn't have solved the problem. Suppose they privatized both the fur and the meat, they would have in a way gone too far and reduced their hospi hospitability to the neighbors uh, in a way. Uh, so some forms of privatization are better than others. There's such a thing as, you might try to privatize a piece of land over which maybe pheasant or deer or something like that migrates and goes back and forth. Or maybe a section of an ocean fishery, you put a fence around a patch of the ocean. But if the school of fish migrates back and forth, it doesn't solve the problem because then you just have fishermen waiting on the other side of the boundary as soon as the fish crosses the border, it, it gets taken. So then you, you so that's a prescription for overfishing, not for conservative fishing. And uh, originally the term fugitive resource came up in the case of oil. So you might have your different parcels of land, but when oil was discovered and made into a valuable commodity, then people would drill down, suck out the oil, and reduce the wellhead pressure for neighboring drillers. And so that became what was known as a fugitive resource, and you needed new rules. The fences weren't good enough to manage the oil, to make the oil truly properly a private, uh, private resource. So the point is, not all forms of privatization uh, are equal. Do you have such an institution here as uh, timeshare condominiums? So in Hawaii, there are people who will buy um, a vacation home but they don't buy the entire vacation home. And instead of just buying a piece of the space, they buy a piece of the time. So you might buy <coughs> December of that home. Somebody else owns January, somebody else owns June, and so on. That doesn't, you know, that's a way to make it economical in a way, but that doesn't really prevent it from being a tragic commons either, because on December 31st, when you're packing up to leave, you don't really care that much about January. Uh, so you don't clean up after yourself. In January, they, they don't clean up after themselves. And so the house doesn't stay in good repair. So like I said, not all forms of privatization are equal. So it's not just a simple private versus public. It's not simple capitalism versus communism, something like that. Uh, there are clear differences and clear advantages to private property, but it's it's not a pure, it's not a pure and simple uh, story. So I want to tell you a couple of, a story or two with uh, the ecological uh, overtones. Just a surprising ways in which something can turn into a commons tragedy that you, you know, you wouldn't see this coming. You couldn't make this up. So there's a, rancher in Kenya named Guy Grant. I never met him, but I met somebody who worked for him. He bought the ranch in 1963 at the time in Kenya where he was, he was going to raise cattle. He had 25 zebra on his land at the time, and 30 years later had over a thousand. And he once sold hunting licenses to uh, for hunting uh, elephants, for hunting uh, buffalo, and so on. But uh, these hunting licenses provided a third of his income. Two thirds came from cattle, one third came from, from hunting licenses for wildlife. Well, sport hunting was banned in 1977, and that meant he, he couldn't legally sell hunting licenses anymore, so he stopped that. Now, he could still hunt them himself, which he had to do because he had to keep them from chasing off the cattle, from becoming so overpopulated that there were no room for his cattle anymore. So he still hunted them, and he still made some money from them because he could sell the meat and he could sell the hides in uh, local markets. Well, 
ban in all wildlife products, in trade in all wildlife products, was banned in 1978. So that meant he couldn't sell the hides or the meat anymore either. So because of this ban, this is the, you know, the logic has its way. Um, he has to graze more cattle in order to make the same money, in order to make man's ends meet to uh, sustain his operation. And he so he still has to keep the zebra population down, otherwise it will bankrupt him. The only change is now he can't make money from the zebra. So think about that, what that means. Without income from the zebra, Grant has to graze more cattle. So there's less land for zebra because of the ban. Less room for leaving land as wild land be grazed by wild animals because of the ban. More zebra got shot because of the ban on hunting them for sport. So in Africa, there's no such thing as letting it be. People sometimes say that humans are part of nature. Have you ever heard anyone say that? You know, humans are, they're part of nature. You know, we think we're something apart. Oh no, we're part of nature. You ever heard people say that? They say it condescendingly, like they've had this great insight. What they don't understand is that what they're saying is actually true. And it's very true in Africa. In Africa, when they force other humans to let it be, they are the ones who are refusing to let nature be because the humans that they interfere with really are an integral, essential part of the nature that they claim to respect. When they refuse to let people be, they're refusing to let nature be, they're removing what for five million years has been that ecology's keystone natural predator. So again, the logic of the system if people can't profit from wildlife, what does that mean? Human beings decide how much room they're going to leave for wildlife. Africans decide how much room they will leave for wildlife. And how much they leave will depend on how much they can afford to leave. And how much they can afford to leave depends upon whether the wildlife is helping them or hurting them, helping them to make a living, helping to feed their children. So if we say that elephants are the world's priceless heritage, and it's immoral to profit on the backs of elephants, then elephants have to go to make room for cattle. If we allow elephants to be an engine of prosperity for the local people, then cows will have to go to make room for elephants, because a cow, an elephant is worth 30 to 60 times more Hunting licenses for elephants go for thirty to sixty thousand dollars in countries where the background, otherwise the per capita income, is two thousand dollars. So ecosystems evolve. What does it mean to fix something? You know this word. You have a word like this, fix. Uh, at least in English. I apologize for the translators. I hope you've worked this out. In, in English, the word fix, you know what that means, fix? It means to repair something. Does it? Uh, or does, does the word fix have another meaning? In English, it has another meaning. When we fix a schedule or we fix a mortgage rate, do you use the same word here or different word? OK, when we fix a mortgage rate, we aren't repairing the mortgage rate. What we're doing is we're stabilizing it. We're preventing it from changing. And in that sense, we want to fix wildlife. We want to fix our parks. We want to fix the wilderness. We want to prevent it from changing. But we can't. Not without turning this land that we want to preserve into something other than the ongoing process that it is. 
Ecosystems evolve. Cultures evolve too. Something is always being lost. Always. Something is always decaying. There's probably never been a generation that didn't see its world as going to hell in one way or another. And correctly, we really are always losing something. We don't pay as much attention to what we're gaining, but uh, we're very aware of what we're losing. Now, of course, we want to intervene. But uh, there are complications. So we're intervening in a process of change. So by the time we devise regulations to solve the problem that we had when we started the political process, the world has moved on and the problem isn't the same as the one that we started out trying to fix. And when we try to fix an ecosystem, to the extent that we succeed, we're really turning that ecosystem into something that no longer runs according to its own internal logic. So we're trying to take something wild and turn it into a potted plant. And a potted plant, anybody got your own potted plants? It needs constant intervention. You can't let it be. If you let it be, it will die. So you have to take care of it every day. It can't take care of itself anymore. And that's what we've done in the name of fixing all over. So, you know, thought for the day. If you're trying to prove that your heart is in the right place, it isn't. If your heart is actually in the right place, you're not trying to prove anything like that. You're actually trying to solve a problem. You're trying to work with the logic of the system. You don't treat people as if they're nothing more than stomachs, incapable of taking responsibility for themselves. You get in people's way only to limit their ability and their incentive to get in other people's way. You don't try to defy the system's internal logic. People don't, people don't need a central planner in order to give them a language. You have a language. It evolves spontaneously. Is it rational? Is, it, is, it, is your language efficient? Is it efficient for you to need me to translate? I mean, you think, let's be rational here. Let's, let's force all of you to learn English so that you don't need a translator anymore. Let's save money on translators. I'm sorry, translators, I'm no offense. But, you know, you're, we, should, we shouldn't need you, right? You should all learn English. And so, what do you say when I say you should all learn English? Well, you're smiling, but you know, wait, there's something laughable about the idea of central planning a language. Tomorrow, somebody will invent some ridiculous new toy or drink or something like that, and the language will change. It'll need to change, and a central planner won't be able to keep up with it. People can keep up with it. Spontaneously evolving language can adapt very rapidly to new needs. You know, there's some, there is something lost. There's something goes to hell. You, you end up having a thousand languages in the world and uh, people who can't communicate very well. But it's, imagine instead a central planner trying to make everybody in the world learn Esperanto. That would be a disaster. We'd end up unable to communicate. Communication would be something that only happened on the black market. So, your property rights, in a way, uh, it's like a language. So when we say we should central plan your language, it's your language. Nobody can take that away from you. So uh, you know, when you really need to change, when you need to make up a new word, you will. Uh, so we don't need to do that for you. Uh, when you have a central planner, you think people make mistakes all the time. So many people, everybody, they're making mistakes every day, bad decisions every day. And so you create a central planner to stop people from making mistakes. What's actually happening when you create a central plan? You're making sure that the mistakes won't be small. You make sure that when there is a mistake, it'll be big, and it'll bring down the whole society, or throttle back, retard the progress of the whole society. That's the thing we do with the central planner. And the central planner won't have much incentive to learn from the mistake either, because somebody else is paying for it. All he has to make sure is that he shifts the blame. He comes up with a story about how his budget wasn't big enough or 
something like that. So what's the point? Well, part of the point is that freedom is an elusive goal. Uh, even Friedrich Hayek acknowledged that we need law and legislation as a framework for freedom. So the thing that we need as a framework for freedom is itself the greatest threat to our freedom. And the hell of it is, we need it anyway. We still need it. Uh, the law is itself the greatest threat, and the power of uh, the law uh, being captured by tyrants who, in their hearts, in their minds, are convinced that their heart is in the right place. So we need eternal vigilance against tyranny, but we can't be vigilant unless we're educated, unless we're educated about not to, what to fear and what not to fear. I mean, we know somebody, like a, a German with a mustache like this, we know we're supposed to fear that person. But how about someone who wants to socialize medicine and make you go to him if you want permission to see a doctor? Do we know that that person is a person to fear? No, I don't think we know that, unfortunately. So in, uh, in 2011, uh, my co-author, Jason Brennan, and I published something that we call the Brief history of liberty, and I wanted to use this as a cover photo. We actually couldn't get it, because this photo was an artist's private property, and she wouldn't give us permission to use the photo on her cover. So that's life. Uh, you know, for one minute there, I wanted to be a communist, and I wanted to say, I'm taking your property uh, and using it for my cover. But, uh, but other people didn't agree with me that I should have that power. So we didn't get to use this on our cover. I love this photo, though. It's a, it's a perfect symbol about what's good and what's bad about freedom. Freedom is like a roller coaster. I mean, it's fun. It's exhilarating. It's also frightening. Really bad things can happen to people on roller coasters. Um, so uh, the negative is that freedom isn't comfortable. It doesn't feel like security. It feels like insecurity. It isn't a lullaby. With uh, freedom goes responsibility. And responsibility can be terrifying. The responsibility to stand or fall by your own merit. That's a big responsibility. It's like jumping out of an airplane. It can be frightening. But that's also where the fun is. The positive is that freedom is exhilarating. It's the greatest feeling. It's the greatest taste in the world. But it doesn't feel secure.